Every Friday, ranchers around South Dakota bring their cattle here, to this livestock auction, just outside the small town of St. Ange, to be sold by this man, Justin Tepper, the owner and auctioneer at St. Ange Livestock. A lot of guys bringing in those cows. They're bringing them in for the normal sale day. St. Ange Livestock is a family business. Emily is helping clerk. Maggie's been helping outside. Cody will be here a little bit, and he'll work the night shift. And Brooke, my wife, is doing the books. Justin's sale barn facilitates millions of dollars in sales on a day like today. I would guess somewhere between three and five million. And it happens like this. Cattle get dropped off in this pen. Then they are tagged and shuffled along this labyrinth-like system until it's their turn to be sold, and they enter the sale barn here. This ring is actually a huge scale, so bidders know how much the cattle weigh. As the bidders, who are other ranchers, watch from the stands, Justin or another auctioneer lead the auction with what's called a chant. So that's what the auction's all about, is trying to create a fevered pitch that get you to bid one or two more times more than you anticipated because you're caught up in the moment. Bidders are looking at the cow's weight, breed, and age, and considering outside factors like the weather and the futures market. An almost imperceptible raise of the hand indicates a bid, and it all ends with the highest bidder. This process happens more than 100 times that day. It is price discovery at work, creating a value for a commodity, in this case, through friendly competition. When they come into the cafe, they'll sit and visit with each other and be very cordial. Sooner or later, they'll be split up out in the seats and they'll be bidding against each other. Small farmers and ranchers selling their product at auction has a long legacy in the U.S. And the stakes are high for people selling cattle. For some, the highest bid on this board is all the money they'll make that year. And lately, those prices haven't been enough for many of them to make it. In the past 50 years, about 40% of cattle ranchers have gone out of business. Healthy competition in a market means that there are numerous small producers and buyers who compete equally for a commodity. And as a result, not one player exerts outsized control over its price. But in the American beef industry, something's off balance, and it's ruining the competition for everyone. The buyers and sellers coming to these auctions represent the different stages of cattle ranching, all of which are affected by a lack of competition in the industry. I'm Matthew Kammerer from Rapid City, South Dakota. Matthew is a cow-calf producer, a small-scale rancher who breeds cows and raises calves on grass until a certain age. From getting up in all kinds of weather and times of night to uh, check on first calf heifers to branding in the springtime, putting up hay for feed in the winter, and hopefully we bring one hell of a product here for the backgrounder. A backgrounder is the next ranch cattle usually cycle through, another small or medium-scale ranch where calves graze until they reach a certain weight. I buy from uh, the producer who raised that calf as a baby. They'll feed them um, to an age of 700 pounds. Then a backgrounder sells to a feedlot, like this one. I'm Ted Thompson from Whitewood, South Dakota. I take cattle to the feed yards and finish cattle. Just like it sounds, finishing cattle is the last step of the cattle production cycle. The feedlot owner then sells the finished cattle to the meat packer, the company that slaughters them, and sells their meat to consumers, companies like Tyson or National Beef. These three types of ranchers do all of their sales through competitive bidding at livestock auctions like Justin's. But the sale between feedlot owners and the meat packers looks a lot different. And that has to do with this powerful player and over a century of history. The creation of our antitrust laws really is tied to the meat industry. Claire Kellaway is a reporter and researcher on consolidation in agriculture. I report on everywhere where corporate power shows up across the food supply chain. Around the turn of the century, there were highly consolidated meat packers. They were called the Beef Trust, five companies that controlled most of the market. 
that's generally considered excessively concentrated. And so you have risks of companies not competing for the lowest prices, all different kinds of what we would consider anti-competitive or unfair behavior. It prompted an upcry over the prices and conditions for farmers who were working with these meat packers. In 1921, President Warren Harding signed the Packers and Stockyards Act into law to assure fair competition and to safeguard farmers and ranchers. In the decades after this law was passed, the top four meatpacking companies in the beef industry controlled about 25% of the market. That's under the 40% threshold of what's considered an overly concentrated market. Under the Reagan administration, the U.S. legal system transformed their approach to big business. Around the 1980s, a really conservative school of economic thought took over a lot of policy, including antitrust. And this allowed for a super permissive antitrust policy. What followed was 40 years of mergers and acquisitions, especially in the meatpacking industry, without the U.S. government intervening. Over that same time, while ranches went out of business, feedlots got a lot bigger to service their corporate customers. This drive to become bigger and to cut costs, pushing more destructive forms of livestock production. So the rise of more concentrated animal farms, which have huge externalized costs on the environment. The result is a beef industry where the top four companies process 85% of all the cattle produced in the U.S., well above the anti-competitive threshold. Today, those companies are Tyson, JBS, Cargill, and National Beef. And if you eat beef, you more than likely buy it from them when you shop at a conventional grocery store. Concentration might not be something that most people see. There are some big name brands that we're familiar with, but because these companies have bought up a lot of other companies, it creates sort of an illusion of choice. The fact that four companies buy and process nearly all the beef in the U.S. creates a bottleneck here between them and the feedlot owners, who buy from the backgrounders and the cow-calf producers. The public might only see the vulnerabilities of this structure when disaster strikes, like when a fire took out a Tyson plant in 2019, when multiple meatpacking plants shut down in 2020 due to the COVID pandemic, or in 2021 when JBS underwent a cyber attack, forcing plant closures. During these events, they paid ranchers less and charged consumers more. In a 2021 Senate hearing, a Tyson representative attributed this price spread to the law of supply and demand. Because of closed plants, the supply of live cattle outpaced processors' ability to process those cattle. But many people see the reliance on so few plants to process cattle as exactly the problem. Cattle producers are saying this is clear evidence of highly concentrated meat packers using their position in the middle of the market to maximize their profits. Before the industry got so concentrated again in the 80s, meatpacker representatives from different companies used to fill these stands like everyone else, contributing to price discovery and higher prices for ranchers. But today, they aren't there. Packers don't like bidding for cattle. They want to be running their plants at full capacity and they want to know how much cows are coming in. That's why about 72% of the sales in 2021 between feedlot owners and meat packers is through a contract instead of an auction, which removes them completely from the price discovery process. The other 28% is still negotiated. But with only four big meat packers, there are fewer bids and they typically don't take place at an auction. Instead, buyers from the packing industry often go straight to a feedlot owner like Ted. They'll typically go around to feed yards and see their show list. Many times they don't see any buyers. They may get a phone call from them and say, This is what we'll give today. There's not a competitive nature that happens there. In Colorado, for example, two years of USDA reports like this one show negotiated cattle prices as confidential because there are so few bidders that disclosing prices might reveal who the bidder is, a violation of confidentiality laws. 
More competition raises prices, something every cattle rancher like Brad knows from experience. He paused our interview to bid on a live stream of an auction happening at a sale barn. There's all the information, just like you see in the sale barn. 14 head. I'm going to bid right here. And did it go through? Yep. See, he tells me. I'm going to stay off. So you didn't win that one? No. Nope. No? It was too high? That's where, that's where I wanted to stop. Yeah. 70 bucks, yep. Yeah. But what did you do for the person that won that? Buyer 60. I think he was asking 160. So between me and the people in the seats there, it's 40 bucks that that rancher put in his pocket just because he had competitive people per calf. And then it's a huge deal. You know, a lot of times it's make or break. Probably the most important bidder in the price discovery or the auction process is the guy who didn't get them because he bid against the guy who got them right up to the last bid. So he drove that price there. Not having those competitive bids for the sale between meat packers and feedlot owners means Ted might get a lower price, which means they have less to bid on for the backgrounder, like Brad. And the backgrounder has less to give to the cow-calf producer, like Matthew. And that trickle-down effect is one reason why about 40% of cattle ranches have disappeared since 1980, which means rural America has lost hundreds of thousands of small family businesses. Whether you're worried about the survival of your business. Yep. It's a, it's a legacy out there. And uh, it, it's not going to get any easier for these families. It's losing the legacy of, uh, of the, family, the family ranch and stuff. Great Gamper came here in 1882. And I live in the same log house that he built. It's infuriating. Think of what some of that money, if it would have trickled down to the countryside, where we would be. The Senate Agriculture Committee looked at cattle industry markets, including the rise in beef prices. In 2021, the U.S. government started investigating whether lack of competition in cattle markets requires legal or policy intervention and Justin Tupper was there to testify. I want to welcome to the committee Mr. Justin Tupper. Since 2015, corporate packers' gross margin has ballooned from an average of $100 to $200 a head to well over $1,000 a head. While cattle producers go out of business and consumers pay double or even triple at the meat counter. Solutions to promote competition include a proposed bill that would reduce the amount of contract sales between feedlot owners and meat packers from 72% to 50%. We're making it easier for more meatpacking companies, more bidders in other words, to enter the market. To enforcing antitrust laws that were created for this very purpose. The American rancher often serves as a symbol of independence, but they've lost their independence from the few corporations that control the beef industry and make it impossible to compete. Thanks for watching this first episode of our series with Future Perfect, a team at Vox that explores big problems and the big ideas that can help tackle them. We'll be diving into crucially important issues like climate change, animal welfare, and global health. We'll be exploring them through angles that are often neglected and identifying the most effective solutions. In this first season, we're looking at the human cost of meat. The current scale of industrial meat production undoubtedly has an impact on animals, but it also deeply affects people, people who consume meat, people who work in the meat industry, and people who live next to factory farms. In future episodes, we'll be looking at other ways that the meat industry has changed the way people work and live.